Welcome to the League Forum on the reauthorization of the Columbia River Treaty in a new era of climate change, tribal rights, and water scarcity. The Columbia River has been central to Pacific Northwest history, from the Ice Age floods that formed our present river to the establishment of tribal villages and salmon fishing sites, to the explorations of Lewis and Clark, to the many early uses for navigation and irrigation, followed by the era of dam building that was between 1928 and 1957 to produce more hydropower. And then for this landmark cooperative management agreement with our neighbor Canada, the Columbia River Treaty, signed in 1964. The League, the National League, understood the immense importance of the Columbia River and its, and its importance to the development of the Northwest. And they encouraged the leagues of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and Montana, which are in all in the Columbia River Basin, to undertake a study. And it was a quite an elaborate, uh, thorough study of everything you would ever want to know about the Columbia River. Um, it was published in 1959, so it was about the same time the Columbia River Treaty was uh, uh, finalized. Also, the Seattle League uh, also did their own study uh, that called the Columbia River, ba your Columbia River Basin, and it was published um, the same year. I think Lois North is someone who was on that uh, committee, and so we appreciate all of their all of their work. Um, the, that interest in the Columbia has been sustained over the years with more studies and positions. Um, uh, re more recently, um, the National League again encourages, encouraged the Northwest League to get involved in this reauthorization of the Columbia River uh, Treaty called the Columbia River Review. And it's been going, started about uh, 2010 or 11 to uh, 2013. And uh, so Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, Montana didn't do it this time. We all took part and went to the listing sessions and watched about 1,000 hydrographs, <laughs> thanks to the BPA, and um, submitted comments. And it was really a very uh, interesting process and uh, I think we all lear learned an, a lot, and it was good to kind of participate. Um, uh, tonight, we have three panelists who have all played important roles in that process. Okay, our first uh, panelist is Scott uh, Sims. Uh, Scott has been secretary to the U.S. entity. Uh, and the U.S. entity is the lead um, U.S entity, uh, which is working on, on, on uh, the, um, the treaty. And it consists of Bonneville uh, Power Administration and the U.S. Corps of Engineers. And so that U.S. entity is working with a Canadian entity, and that is the province of British Columbia and BC Hydro. Um, it's mainly the province that's involved in the treaty because that's where the Columbia River uh, has its origin. Um, Scott, uh, besides being secretary to the U.S. entity, he has been with uh, Bonneville Power Administration uh, for quite a long time. And he is also the active manager for long-term power planning at BPA. And the BPA headquarters are in Portland, Oregon. Um, Previous to that, he was a spokesperson for Portland General Electric. He is a graduate of Washington State University. He got his degree in political science and communication. Scott? I want to start off with actually a few things. First of all, we want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for uh, the great turnout you have had uh, in the listening sessions we've had over the last couple of years. We, we think it's so important uh, to make sure that we're engaging the entire Northwest in the discussions about the Columbia River Treaty. And uh, we're proud that we have seen you show up in communities across the Northwest. So 
Uh, so thank you for that. Also, thank you. It's a beautiful night outside. So thank you for showing up uh, inside our church building uh, <laughs> to uh, talk a little bit about the treaty. Um, the treaty discussions are always a difficult one we find uh, as we go out and talk to the public about it because there are a large number of folks who have done a lot of homework about it and have read up quite a bit about it. And then there are folks who, uh, who haven't as much. And, and so the learning curve can be quite different. We find that even inside BPA, we actually have a, a learning curriculum where we have a 101 level class and a 201 level class just to sort people out a little bit. So I'm gonna do um, what I do at home with my eight-year-old and say, have you done your homework yet? So who has read the voter for April? All right, okay, it looks like more on this side of the room than that side of the room, okay. No cheating. Okay, so what we're gonna do is um, I have a, a lot more slides than I can cover in 15 minutes, and I know it would be uh, terrible for me to just speak very quickly. So what we'll do is we're gonna talk a little bit just to get a foundational step here, and then we'll go forward. And we can always reference some, uh, some of the slides that uh, we have in here at a later time uh, if you have questions that, that pertain to a slide. And I'm proud to say that there's only one hydrograph. So uh, you're saying there's uh, thousands of hydrographs you've had to go through with. That's, that's the, the engineering side of our business that uh, they, they like to talk about those hydrograph. So um, what we typically do on these uh, um, treaty overviews is do the background of the treaty, understanding of the treaty review process, which is a process that we've been in now for a few years. Implications for the Canadian entitlement. So um, as was referenced uh, here with the um, US entity, it's really half BPA and half uh, US Army Corps of Engineers Northwestern Division that make up the US entity. I'm actually a BPA employee. It was actually written into the treaty, inter interestingly enough, to have the secretary be a BPA employee because we're self-financed and there was a worry that uh, at the Corps of Engineers, uh, the way that they're funded with congressional appropriations, you could potentially see that position disappearing. So the thought was, let's have more permanency by putting the position at, at BPA, which is kind of an interesting uh, side note there. Um, so adjust your glasses, uh, get closer to the screen if you have to. <laughs> Just a couple of quick points. And I, you, many of you may be familiar with um, uh, with this slide, but essentially uh, we have an amazing amount of, of water storage in this basin, and a lot of it uh, is up in the Columbia River Basin area, up in, in the Canadian waters. And as it gets down uh, toward the U.S., we actually have less of that, uh, that storage ability, which is why uh, it, it made it so important to have a discussion with Canada about um, storage because of the fact that they had so much vast storage potential, especially uh, back in the days of the start of the treaty when there were very low populations. Um, in terms of the treaty power provisions, um, we have essentially a obligation, and I think one of the reasons it was really successful with the United States and Canada in the start of the treaty is that it was really about an equal sharing of the benefits. There was, uh, at that time, an even smaller population in Canada versus the United States, and there was a real fear and concern that here was this giant United States, we were you know, in that uh, after the war mode where we were chugging forward with industry and development, and we were a force to be reckoned with, and Canada was thinking, gee, you know, here's this, uh, here's this monster neighbor uh, to our south, how will, how will a discussion about sharing our water go? And one of the things that was, I think, of crucial importance, at least from the folks we've talked to from early on in the treaty, was the fact that we would do a calculation of that downstream benefit of, of working with that water and managing it and coordinating the, the operation of the river and then sharing that on a 50-50 split. That 50-50 split, by the way, is a calculated benefit. There's a, a, a methodology that requires a high number of staff at BPA and the Corps to and our compatriots at the Canadian entity on an annual basis to make sure that we are calculating those benefits appropriately and correctly with uh, the uh, tenants of the treaty. Um, that's actually something that would be potentially great to modernize in the future to uh, make that a lot more of an efficient process. Um, last piece here that I want to uh, address is that the owners of the five mid-Columbia um, non-federal hydro facilities, they do receive a benefit by having a coordinated river operation. And as such, uh, it was determined that they should have a share in providing essentially that benefit back to Canada. And so they do have a 27.5% stake in, in that obligation that is returned to Canada. So of the, of the total U.S. obligation, they're on the hook for 27.5% of that. They deliver it to us, and then we take care of sending it via those wires back up to, uh, back up to B.C. Flood control provisions were really the driving force of the treaty in terms of getting it kicked into gear. Um, 
Uh, unfortunately, as we continue to learn across the United States and across the world, nothing like a crisis gets people motivated to move and, and get things going. The Vanport flood was uh, a critical point at which people said, enough's enough, we've got to cement this uh, situation with Canada and work on a more uh, controlled operation of this very wild river. Um, which is a wonderful river, but uh, as you'll see later in, in the one hydrograph I have, um, it has a very interesting shape in terms of what happens when we have a massive snow melt and, and spring runoff. Um, the, uh, the, the prepaid flood control ended up being a, a, heck, of a, a heck of a deal. Um, what we essentially did, I'm trying to make sure we've got the, the numbers right here, but I think it was 64.4 million. Um, uh, for yes, yeah, 64.4 million. Because see, I can't, I can't even read it on my own screen. Um, for the prepaid uh, flood control storage, and this is the part we always have the Corps of Engineers do, because we're the electricity people and they're the flood people. But um, certainly, this was an amazing amount of uh, uh, of discussion between the United States and Canada about how would you go about actually calculating a value for future flood control actions that would be taken. Uh, and what they determined was 64.4 million was essentially uh, one half the present worth of the expected future U.S. flood damages prevented from 1968 through 2024. Again, we got a heck of a deal. Um, because certainly we know that even in today's calculations from Hurricane Katrina, from Sandy, from other events that have happened across our country and across the world, um, there's far more damage than just physical damage. There's economic stoppage. Um, there are obviously lives lost. Uh, and other um, disruptions that take place um, when you have natural disasters like that. Okay, here's our one hydrograph. So uh, those of you who don't like hydrographs, uh, you can take a little tiny nap right now. Um, we're going to not go through all the details of this, but one really important point. So the DOP, by the way, up there, you see a little key. DOP means um, detailed operating plan. We have, we have an assured operating plan and we have a detailed operating plan. The assured is basically a five-year window of how you're going to operate the river. Uh, in agreement with Canada, and then the detailed is really the one-year view. And those little uh, plus SOA are supplemental operating agreement, and then you've got the last one, which is uh, supplemental operating agreements plus the biological opinion. So the biological opinions have come along later as uh, it's been determined that um, essentially we had some uh, endangered fish issues. Uh, fish in the salmon in the river were listed and needed to be protected. Uh, the biological opinion essentially has actions that we take to help uh, with flows. But the important part to note is, regardless of which one of those, DOP, DOP plus SOA, and the other one, that regardless of what you look at there, if you look at those compared to the dotted line, this is a, a stream flow at the Dalles um, example from 2011, 2012 water year. You'll see what would have happened uh, through calculations of what would have happened with the stream flows if we didn't have uh, regulated flows. So you essentially would have lower summer, You'd have lower all the way fall through winter, and then you would have a massive spike in those spring months. And this is, of course, um, one of those pieces we talk about when we talk about balance is that there have for sure been impacts from these dams being put in the river, but there have also been benefits. And this is one of those benefits that you can see where you see uh, a better flood control regime, and you also see a more optimized use uh, for po uh, power production, as well as navigation, as well as something that's huge for Washington State, irrigation for crops. So um, what we can do now is I'll just, uh, I don't want to be the guy that they get the hook and they start turning the music up. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to wing through this really quickly. There's a lot of um, misnomers, and we talked a little bit about this in the um, the call in prepping for today's uh, discussion, uh, a lot of misnomers about the treaty review and why the impetus is on 2014-2024. And one of the best ways we've been able to sort of uh, describe it succinctly, or at least this is our attempt, maybe it's not the best way, if you have feedback, I'd love to hear it afterwards, um, is that the, the treaty has no specific end date, uh, but either nation can terminate most of the power provisions of the treaty as early as September 2024 with a minimum of 10 years written notice from either one. That means on September 16th, 20, 2014, we could have seen a note from Canada that says, hey, it's been great, but we're going to call it good in 10 years. Uh, and they also thought maybe they'll get a, we'll, they'll get a letter uh, certified from US mail saying, we're done. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. Um, either one uh, still has that opportunity. And of course, that's just a 10-year sliding scale. So for instance, if they said in July uh, of this year, 
it would be a 2025 termination. So it's basically a 10-year sort of rolling, but that was the first start of when you could say, I think I'd like to part ways. Uh, the second part is that, remember we talked about the flood control being prepaid. Um, now it'll essentially be switched to a pay-as-you-go plan. So for those of you who've been locked into terrible cell phone plans and wish you could get into a new one, this is kind of that, that way of thinking about it, is that it's the pay-as-you-go plan. Um, how that will work is a major issue about uh, you know, how we see the situation between Canada and the United States. Um, there is essentially a provision that says you need to have effective use of U.S. reservoirs before you call on Canada to say, hey, we need you to catch some water. Um, and so there's a, an active discussion, um, I'd say, in the Canadian camp and among the U.S. camp about how to best uh, orchestrate that in the future and what might be fair. Um, and that is yet to play out. So, so uh, stay tuned on that one. Um, I'm going to just zip through this one because we talked a little bit about post-2024 uh, flood control going to essentially a pay-as-you-go plan. Um, we had a number of uh, joint studies that led up to then a, uh, with Canada, to sort of set the baseline to make sure we were looking at the same things the same way, so sort of the apples-to-apples apples world. And then we went to the phase two, which is where a lot of uh, folks in this room got involved, which is when we started doing stakeholder outreach and stakeholder engagement, as well as sovereign engagement and a sovereign review process. And so here you can see um, on that visual uh, to the right, the SRT being the sovereign review team, uh, the stakeholders, the Department of State, um, other government entities, and of course then uh, we, we put ourselves at the center of the world for that one. But that was because in the regional uh, engagement part, one thing we talked about with State Department was um, we wanted to be working with this region uh, very closely and working with tribal governments and working with other sovereigns and other stakeholders and have the support of Washington, D.C. through the State Department. And then when we got a regional recommendation, we would do essentially a, uh, okay, tag, you're it, and then we would go into the support mode of being the technical supporters for them, and they would run uh, the, the uh, driver's seat in terms of the process. So a um, lot of technical studies have been done, three rounds uh, of modeling. Um, we, have, uh, we put into the modeling hydropower flood risk management and the ecosystem-based function, our recommendation um, from the region certainly was let's address the hydropower issues, let's address the flood control issues, and let's also make sure that we're looking at ecosystem-based management, including the existing investments that are already being made in the system um, under the BIOP, under the uh, Columbia Basin Fish Accords with tribal parties and other agreements. Um, so there's the regional recommendation. I think we were all pleased to get it there. <laughs> I know that Paul and his team worked uh, immensely hard. Lots of folks in this room had contributions to, uh, uh, to this final recommendation from the, from the United States uh, view, or I should say the Northwest view from the United States to DC. And so there's the goal for it. Uh, the region's goal is the, for the United States and Canada to develop a modernized framework for the treaty that maintains a similar level of flood risk and assures reliable and economic hydropower benefits while providing a more resilient and healthy ecosystem-based function throughout the Columbia River Basin. And one thing you know that I really appreciated about the 1959 uh, League of Women Voters um, piece that was written by the Seattle chapter was, it was very thorough, it was quite long, very good piece. Um, I appreciated that the 1959 study as well as your current issue of the voter said flexibility is really important in the treaty. And I think as we're talking about the future of climate change, we're talking about totally different uh, you know, economic and societal factors, we have to look at having a lot of flexibility built into it. So I think what I'd like to do is instead of going through all the uh, additional pieces is not hog all the speaking time, we can talk a little bit more uh, in a few minutes in the one-on-one -on -one basis, but um, I wanted to at least get us uh, started off on, on that, and I think Paul's probably gonna take it from here. Thank you very much, Scott. <clears throat> We do <clears throat> have a copy of the, re uh, the regional recommendation on the table over there. <clears throat> and also there's a copy of our league letter um, uh, of our, co our comments uh, to the draft league uh, recommendation. Okay, our next um, uh, speaker is Paul Lumney. Paul is the executive director <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Paul is executive director of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. He uh, returned in 2009 um, to the Fish Commission after working in Washington, D.C. on tribal issues for a number of government agency. He has a long previous history of working with Northwest tribes on salmon issues in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission is based in Portland, and it is dedicated to restoring salmon runs into their historic range and protecting the tribe's treaty reserve fishing rights. He is a member of the Yakima tribe. He was born in Toppenish, and he graduated from Western Washington University with the Bachelors of Science in Mathematics. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I just wanted to echo uh, some of Scott's comments about how much we appreciate the uh, input from the League of Women Voters. You have came to many of the listening sessions, and your comments have always been very thoughtful, and the documents you presented, very very well put together, so a uh, great amount of respect to, the, to this group. Thank you very much for the honor to be here as well. Before I uh, actually get into talking a, a very much about the Columbia River Treaty, I want to take a step back and talk about the foundation of tribal culture. And uh, this is the way I was raised as well. Um, the, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the concept called first foods. Uh, in uh, Indian country, uh, we're taught that when, um, when the humans were placed on earth, we, we couldn't really survive. And, and the creator asked for volunteers to come forward uh, and um, to help these humans. And the first ones to come forward was the, the salmon, followed by the game, and then the roots and the berries. And so the Creator gave us these gifts, these sacrifices, and uh, He said, I'm going to give these to you for your survival, but uh, here's the deal. Uh, you have to agree to take care of these first foods. And if you take care of these first foods, then these first foods will take care of you. And so that is grounded in me as a Native American and most of Indian country throughout the Pacific Northwest. And so if you just understand this concept alone in working with Indian country, it will take you a long ways. So the, the tribes that I work for, Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce, we all have the same kinds of treaties with the United States. They were signed in 1855. This is language from the treaty from my tribe, Yakima Nation, and it includes language about um, uh, we had reserved the right to fish and hunt at all usual and accustomed places, as well as gathering roots and berries. Well, those are our first foods. So way back in 1855, uh, the elders before me were making sure that they were protecting uh, their, their rights that were given to them by the Creator to have access to these first foods, and it's in our treaties. And so it's very, very clear language here. Some of this language has gone all the way to the Supreme Court, especially the part about fishing. I'm sure many of you have heard about the United States versus Oregon, United States versus Washington. It all came from this. Uh, so the treaty minutes were very clear uh, about uh, what we were giving up. Uh, we gave up land, uh, but we also got land that was ceded uh, to the United States that we had access to some of those rights so that we could exercise our rights to the first foods and other rights as well. Uh, the um, lighter colored uh, areas, that's what's called the ceded areas, and then the darker areas, the colored areas, that's the current reservation boundaries. So you can see within the Columbia River basin that the tribal areas is actually really quite large. And above Bonneville Dam, which is down there just above Portland, um, that's where most of the salmon are spawning in that, in that colored area, because a lot of it's been blocked by dams. So most of the tribal co-managed area is, is in the Columbia Basin is where the fish are. When we signed the treaties way back in 1855, one thing we didn't expect was the major loss of the fish. Uh, it's estimated to be around 17 million on average that came back to the Columbia River, but um, we lost a lot of them. It, actually, in some years, it was as much as 30 million, but we lost a lot of the fish, uh, primarily to overharvest in the ocean and habitat degradation, agriculture, timber uh, uh, farming. So uh, we lost a lot of the fish even before the first dams came into the Columbia Basin, which is in the 1930s. Um, the nice thing, though, is that in recent years, especially the last couple of years, we've had a lot of fish come back, and so we're starting to see a rebound, which is really good news. We lost some big um, fishing areas. This is the first one to go. This is above Grand Coulee Dam. Grand Coulee was built in the 19, th late 1930s, and this reservoir came up and covered up Cattle Falls in 1940, and we lost a major tribal fishery in that area. We also lost the fish 
because Grand Coulee Dam was not built with any fish passage. Another major falls that was, that was lost was the um, Celilo Falls, which was uh, lost when the Dells Dam was built in 1957. Uh, we still have fish passage there, which is great, but we lost a, a major way of life back when that dam was built. It was a great area for people to come together, tribes and non-tribal. It was a huge economic hub in the Pacific Northwest, and it was a great loss to, to the natives when, when we lost the falls. It, it is a, a big river. I don't know if you all have seen the Columbia River, but it is a very big river, and there are very big dams on the river. But we did have our treaties with the United States, and we did reserve our rights to those first foods, and that cannot be taken away. I'm really glad Scott talked earlier about the uh, Vanport flood. Uh, Vanport flood was a, a very bad situation. People were allowed to build in the floodplain. They shouldn't have built there to begin with. The story is that um, this shipbuilder wanted to um, have his community in Portland, in the city of Portland. The city said, no, we don't want your kind in the city of Portland. We want our city to be a really nice city. You need to move your shipbuilding and all your people out of the city. And so he moved to a place called Vanport, which is um, a place that was in the floodplain, not protected by any kind of a dike that was me meant to hold back uh, a, a flooding river. There was a, a railroad dike there, but um, it's actually a, a terrible environmental justice issue with what happened to these people. When that flood claimed they really had no protection, a lot of people died. They should never have been a, a building there to begin with. And, and they were treated really quite badly even after the flood. But what happened with this flood, though, is it, it spurred both countries into taking action, like Scott was telling you. This, you know, a major event caused action. There, were actually, there was actually quite a bit of talk before, um, even 1948 here, about an international water treaty, and they were including all kinds of different things with power, with not just power and flood control, but also the ecosystem, irrigation needs, municipal water. So all those things were in the mix until this flood happened. And then when the flood happened, they decided, well, let's just skip over all that other stuff and just focus on power and flood control. And then everything else can be dealt with as domestic issues. Turned out to be not a good choice. Now we have fish listed under the Endangered Species Act. So it certainly didn't turn out good for the fish either. Um, Scott already covered a lot of this. I'm, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. There were um, four dams that were built as a result of the treaty, three in Canada, one in Montana. Um, there's no passage at, um, the, uh, at, at Grand Coulee, which is a little bit lower, uh, but there's no passage at the Canadian dams as well. And uh, Scott already talked about the 10-year notice. I want to point out, though, at that bottom bullet there, it says, or arrow, excuse me, um, the tribes were not consulted and there's no fish and wildlife uh, in, included. That's why I had this up there about guns. And that's because this is the same time frame that the tribes are dealing with. During that time frame, we had to actually get our guns out to protect our right to go on the river to catch fish. Even though we had that treaty right, we had to fight for it. People were hurt badly on the river by state game wardens. So we were fighting for our very right for survival. And so during the time frame of the treaty signing, there's no question that we were ignored. Scott had a graph that, graphic that was similar to this, and this is my only graph like this too. So, um, but that <laughs> they are they are similar, but different different historical backdrop here. So the darker um, uh, that fully shaded area that's the historic river. Uh, Scott referred to it as unregulated flow. The um, that sort of yellow colored line that's what happened after those treaty dams went in place. So what happened was, is when, the, when all the water came through, after the snow melted and it came through in May, June, July time frame, all that got pushed to a different time of the year. It got pushed to a time of the year that would avoid that flooding scenario and it allowed people to move into the floodplain and it protected them from that. And then later on we found out, well, we can make some money off of this water if we move it to a different time of the year. So this is a trade-off that happened, um, all to protect Portland from flooding. Up in Canada, there were major town relocations. Churches were relocated. Some towns and built structures were actually burnt to the ground because they didn't have time to move them in time. These big dams came up with big reservoirs, and these are huge reservoirs. Nothing like we have on the United States side. They're much bigger, much longer. And when they lower these reservoirs each year uh, to create storage space for um, snow melt, this is what happens on the right. You see these reservoirs become dry, and so it, this dust blows around, and the residents up there can't depend upon a reservoir that is stable by any fashion. They have terrible times keeping fish surviving in this system, 
and it's just a really bad deal. If, if you, anybody goes up to Canada in the Columbia River Basin and talks about the Columbia River Treaty, they will talk about it like it was yesterday. They are still very angry about what happened to them. They had no choice, it ha uh, and it's all to keep Portland dry. Interestingly, if you go to Montana where uh, another dam was built, the same story. And there, they weren't given much warning either. And so there's water that actually starts in Montana and flows into Canada. So there's actually a flood control benefit that, Cana that, that Canadians get from a, U from a U.S. dam as well. But anyway, not a good deal if you're in Canada uh, above the border, at least according to the residents. The government got a much better deal. Uh, Scott covered a lot of this. This is a little bit more detail than, than maybe you're looking for, but uh, the main thing is that uh, we lose our guaranteed flood storage after 2024. See, the treaty doesn't go away. It just changes, and so we lose that guaranteed flood storage. Uh, we have to do what's called calling upon Canada or called upon flood storage, and we have to do uh, effective use, which means we have to manage our own reservoirs first before we can call upon Canada. And then this uh, payment, um, that goes up to Canada, it's called the Canadian Entitlement. Scott talked about it. Some people refer to it as a dollar value, as if we're writing a check to Canada. It's valued at about 300 million. That's not actually how it works. It's really trading power, but it's uh, to get, um, so that the Canadians get a fairer exchange of the, of the benefits that we're receiving on the U.S. side from that, from that water that's managed differently. There's very little uh, ecosystem included in the treaty. It's really only when uh, each side decides it's mutually beneficial according to the treaty. We were able to get something in there for the endangered species uh, after the Endangered Species Act listings of fish. So you saw one of those lines that, that Scott had on his graph and also was on mine. And there's still no consultation with the tribes uh, or First Nations in Canada. In uh, 2008, um, the, the tribes in the Columbia River Basin decided that we, we were going to stop fighting with each other. And we were fighting quite a bit over the water, over the fish. But when we saw that there was this opportunity here to change the Columbia River Treaty, we said, well, that's enough. We, we have to stop arguing with each other. And we came together in a coalition of 15 tribes who have um, management authorities affected by the Columbia River Treaty, those authorities recognized by the federal government. And uh, we put together what's called a common views document. It's only one page. It's not very long. It describes our concerns with the treaty and what we want to see out of a, out of a you know, something changed out of it. Uh, it was hard to do, but we got it done. And then we started branching out and working with the First Nations. Not too long after getting this uh, Common Views document, we sat down with the U.S. entity and said, you know, we have something to talk about now. We're no longer fighting with each other. We have something to, to deal with here. And the U.S. entity, it was uh, Steve Wright at the time. He was the um, was a, uh, administrator for BPA. He recognized right then that there was a potential here to get a regional consensus. So it was at that meeting where the tribes and the U.S. entity decided that we were going to work towards a regional consensus, present that to the United States, instead of letting people in other parts of the country negotiate, negotiate away our interests. We wanted to make sure, and we had our own ownership here. And so at that meeting, we, invited the, uh, we decided we were going to invite the states to the table, all the sovereigns, and then we'd find a way to include uh, regional stakeholders as well. And so that's where that idea was born, and then it eventually became the regional review. But it really started from that, the birthplace was really after the tribes came to their uh, his historic coalition. And this is what's in the regional recommendation. Uh, we needed to, we need to add the ecosystem, uh, especially focusing on something that's near and dear to the tribes, which is restoring fish passage to historic locations. That means getting fish past Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee dams. It's very important to us. Um, uh, also important to others was uh, recalculating the Canadian entitlement. Uh, we need to address flood control management post-2024. Um, we recognize the water supply interest, and we need to adapt for climate change. Something that uh, I always uh, think about uh, is how are we going to rethink uh, floods? And um, this is a photograph at, at, um, that I took at Grand Coulee, and those are great big uh, tubes that come out for irrigation, but you know, Grand Coulee is a, a major flood control dam. But it's hard for me to impress upon people what a flood is. And a flood is actually a very good thing for a river system. It's natural. It moves salmon smolts out of the river quickly from the main stem Columbia out to the ocean. But the problem with floods is when people are allowed to move into the floodplain. And then when a flood happens, 
they're surprised. Geez, I moved into a floodplain and then I got flooded. Doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> but that's why people believe floods are not to happen when you move into a floodplain, but it does happen. And that's how come floods get a bad name. And so these dams were built all over the Columbia River Basin, including as a part of the Columbia River Treaty, really to stop flooding from happening. We make money off of hydropower too. But when they did that, they transferred a flood that might happen, say, in Portland, to permanent floods behind all of these reservoirs, all the way up the rivers. Those are permanent floods that are there every year. We drive past them, we don't recognize it, but that is an actual flood that has never stopped. And so we've got to rethink floods uh, the way we're viewing them. They're good for river system, and we, in order to restore ecosystem health, we have to find a better way of managing the Columbia River, and that's why the tribes got so involved in the Columbia River Treaty process. Uh, one of the things that we're running into a problem with is the Corps is reluctant to have any major um, effort, at least they have been so far, uh, in looking at flood risk, uh, flood risk management, and, and that's because there were major floods in other parts of the United States and the Corps got blamed for it. Katrina, New Orleans, right? They got blamed for a lot of that. So opening up uh, a conversation, a public conversation about flood, increasing flood risk is something they're not willing to do lightly. Uh, there's reasons why we need to do that, but they're very reluctant to do that. Also, just getting a better understanding of what uh, flood risk management actually is. And so often people look at just the probability, but it's not just the probability of a flood. You have to look at also the dollar value that would be lost. You have to, it's a calculation. So it's the cost times probability. And the reason why that's important is because um, we've, we've heard conversations from the federal government about little bitty flood floods that have happened and they say it's you know there was a flood here it really wasn't a flood it was really say a park bench down by the river that got flooded that wasn't really a flood and we've heard that from them but in order to get there these reservoirs and upriver locations took extraordinary measures and sacrifice for a very little flood uh, that happened so that's why you have to look at cost times probability and the reason why it's so important also is is because uh, uh, post-2024, all that changes. We can no longer just call upon Canada and say, hey, give us some of that um, storage space. You can't do that. You have to pay for it. So as Scott said, it's pay as you go. We also have climate change coming. And climate change is going to change the way the whole river flows. It's going to be a lot less snow melt and more rain flow, uh, rainfall. So uh, just there's so many reasons to look at flood risk management now that even go beyond, the tr beyond what happens with the treaty modernization. If we do nothing with this treaty, the treaty changes, and we know the, the climate's changing too. So there's lots of reasons for us to look at flood risk management. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, fish pa uh, passage in historic locations, those red circles. That's where uh, salmon are currently blocked. Um, uh, from passage. We're focusing right now on the Grand Coulee as it relates to the Columbia River Treaty. Um, the, um, my organization, CRITFIC, hosts what's, uh, what's called the Future of Our Salmon Conferences. We have them about every other year. Um, last year we hosted one and when we announced the topic would be restoring fish passage to historic locations, we were surprised at the outpouring of support and we got all 15 tribes in the Columbia Basin come forward and said they wanted to be co-hosts for this conference, as well as the First Nations in Canada. And so that's why we have all those logos down there. It represents all the First Nations and all the tribes in the Columbia Basin. They all came forward and said, we want to have this conference. It was preceded by a technical workshop in Spokane. And at that workshop, we found out that it is technically feasible to restore fish passage at any dam. So a month later, when we had that conference, it changed everything. Because no longer was it a question of, of if we would have uh, fish passage, but when. And so it became a much different conversation. I want to point out that um, our interests are not just uh, salmon. The upper left-hand corner, that's salmon. We also are interested in uh, sturgeon, lamprey, and bull trout. So we're looking at all species, not just salmon. This, is a, uh, this shows you where the uh, blockages currently are for a salmon passage in the Columbia Basin. These are man-made blockages. And I mentioned uh, climate change earlier, so we're going to have a lot more um, rainfall than snow. Uh, so this uh, year that, that we're in right now is probably going to be an average year for us at some point in the future where we have a lot more um, rain 
fact, we've already had the, the spring snow melt that's already happened. It happened last month. And so we're looking at unprecedented conditions. It could be like that in the future. I, I think that that is our future. It will affect uh, the way we manage uh, salmon in many ways. It will change the uh, severity of our winter floods, which we already had floods this year. And uh, it'll affect the salmon smolts as they're migrating out of the system, and it'll affect uh, spawning habitat. And for those uh, rivers that we still have out there that, are, that still have water in them, that's most likely going to be a lot warmer water. So I want to talk, I'm almost done here. I want to talk a little bit about um, maintaining regional consensus. And the reason is because when, um, when we put together that regional consensus, it, it was for a very important reason. And it's because the Department of State said that they are not going to go to Canada and open up a treaty that's been working fine with a very friendly nation unless we can get our act together out here in the Pacific Northwest. So that's why we put this regional recommendation together. It's got the, the sovereigns and the stakeholders' support. Now, frankly, I think the Department of State didn't think we could do it. I really don't, but we did it, and so now they're wrestling with this uh, opportunity here. Do we go to Canada now and, and open up the door for modernizing the treaty? But we've got to maintain that regional consensus. At any time, all it takes is one party to step away and say, you know, we can't do this any longer. We're going to go another direction. It'll result in the Department of State just walking away from that and leaving the treaty as is. So we've got to maintain this regional consensus, not just even through a decision by the Department of State, but also through an entire renegotiation process. And I have never seen anything like this before in my career, and I've been working for the Fish Commission since 1987. I've never seen a topic like this where we all came together on our own. Usually we go to court, right? Or we go running off to Congress. But you can't do that for Either one, you can't do either one of those uh, in this process. We have to do it together. So this has been a very unique and actually very difficult, but a, a rewarding experience uh, to get that regional recommendation so far. So some things to think about as we move forward uh, in um, uh, for this year is we need to continue making progress towards uh, fish passage studies at Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams, and that process has already started. Uh, with a uh, proposed project uh, through the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. We're awaiting funding uh, for that right now. Scott, isn't that correct? And um, the uh, regional uh, flood risk assessment needs to be initiated, and we need to start talking about water supply with the irrigators and municipal water supply folks. Another thing we need to do is start exploring um, an alternative treaty governance structure. That was identified in the regional recommendation. So right now it's the U.S. entity that's been managing it on the, on the U.S. side, but if we add the ecosystem as a primary driver to a new treaty, then those two entities is probably not going to work. We're going to have to have a different kind of a, a governance structure uh, to manage a new treaty. So I believe that's, that's it. Uh, so that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Rachel Osborne. Uh, Rachel uh, uh, served as a co-founder and past executive director <clears throat> of the Center for Environmental Law and Policy, which is based in Spokane. She was also the co-founder and board member of the Washington Water Trust. These two organizations are dedicated to the protection and restoration of free-flowing waters in Washington State. She is a graduate of the University of Washington, studying in the Institute of Environmental Studies. And she also graduated for the U from the UW Law School, uh, where early on she chose uh, to be interested in water. And she was mentored by Professor Ralph Johnson, a well-known expert in water and Indian law. She is on the faculty of Gonzaga, Gonzaga Law School and is dedicated to teaching water law and policy in law schools, conferences, and seminars. She has also published extensively on water resources and environmental issues, and including a special paper on climate change and the Columbia River Treaty. Rachel works also as a public interest water lawyer, representing Indian tribes, environmental organizations, labor unions, and small communities. Rachel. 
Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here and to uh, be speaking along with Scott and Paul. Paul is a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about, focus a little bit on what climate change means in the Columbia River Basin and for the treaty. Um, you might note the um, amazing piece of artwork here. It's actually done by a miniaturist, uh, Isaac Cordell, politicians discussing global warming. <laughs> <clears throat> So they're leaving it up to the rest of us <laughs> to get something done here. Uh, there are a lot of watersheds shared between the United States and Canada. And it's interesting because for many of them, there are agreements, including, importantly, a Great Lakes Agreement that was uh, concluded uh, a few years ago. And so we have models to look to for how to make uh, transnational governance work. Uh, there are many watersheds also in North America, and this one, of course, uh, Columbia River watershed, I think is a fourth in size, but it is considered to be really a phenomenal river because, as Scott pointed out, the, uh, the, the variability in the flow and uh, the, the drop from uh, headwaters in British Columbia to the Columbia River, which um, uh, lent, lends itself to, uh, handily to hydropower production. Uh, this is another way of looking at the Columbia River system, just to orient you a little bit. And so we have Spokane, where I'm from. By the way, the, the organization I'm with is actually headquartered here in Seattle, but I live over in Spokane. And uh, the Columbia working its way all the way up into Canada, and then it takes a sharp turn and comes down here. So it's actually flowing north, as you can see on this map, before uh, turning around and heading south into the United States. Historically, uh, a beautiful and incredibly uh, productive, biologically productive river system. Um, these two places are still there, but they're the last, pretty much the last free flowing reaches. These are the headwaters uh, wetlands in British Columbia. And if you've never been there, I really recommend you go. It's a fantastic place. Um, and as Paul pointed out, uh, there was a time when there were sites such as Salilo Falls and Kettle Falls that were just incredibly important fishing sites for the tribes and the tribes completely depended upon the salmon that were coming through these systems to and in these areas uh, for uh, sustenance and commerce and cultural cultural reasons uh, but then we began to build dams and we built a lot of them uh, the columbia basin is one of the most hydroelectrically developed uh, watersheds in the entire world actually. This is one way of looking at it. Columbia River as machine, right? So this is a schematic showing starting in the headwaters and coming down and down and around through the Tri-Cities and out to the Pacific Ocean. It's a Corps of Engineers diagram. <laughs> there are actually a few other reservoirs uh, uh, other, there's, you can see the Puget Sound system here, some Southern Oregon, some of the rivers, and, uh, but the primary, you know, the basin itself, most of the dams in the basin are, and reservoirs are in the Columbia River. Um, this is looking at the dams uh, as of dates that they were built. I believe the earliest one was Rock Island Dam in 33, then followed by Bonneville, and of the most recent dam in the United States was Lower Granite in 1975. What this hydrograph shows you is what changed as a result of building those dams. So we have the natural system. We've seen both Scott and Paul had similar hydrographs. And when the US dams came in, they pulled that peak down. But they didn't, it didn't come down as much as um, uh, perhaps as wished for. And so it was the construction of the dams in Canada Here's, uh, this shows the four dams, actually there are three of them in Canada, and then Libby Dam also in Montana was facilitated by the signing of the treaty. Um, here's another way of looking at it. This is the Canadian portion of the basin, and the red circles show the dams, or the reservoirs that uh, now exist as a result of these four dams. And this pushed the hydrograph down further. So we go from natural to the US dams, and now we could, the hydrograph and the, the peak flow is being captured in the huge dam and reservoir systems in the uh, British Columbia, 
dams that were built pursuant to the treaty. So uh, before I go back, uh, start on climate change, I just want to say that obviously this has a huge effect on the system. The, the, the flow of the river, uh, as Paul has eloquently stated, is important. Natural flow is important. There's ecological purposes to it. And so uh, we have to think about that as we think both about climate change and about what we're going to do about in the upcoming um, uh, reevaluation of the treaty. So let's talk for a few minutes about climate change. Um, we are in big trouble. Um, the scientists have told us that we want to have 350 million parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere maximum. And we have, about six weeks ago, popped through 400. We left 350 behind a long time ago. There are some who believe that climate change is at this point irreversible. Uh, when we have, uh, we add uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we wind up with a warming world. And not surprisingly, because CO2 levels are rising as they are, um, we are now seeing every year we're breaking records. Warmest summer on record, warmest winter on record. So, uh, and again, 2014 broke records in terms of how warm things are out there. Climate change, uh, the, the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the warming temperature then affects other things. And the first thing, the harbinger of climate change, really is water and what happens with water because water is so temperature sensitive. There will be um, a number of other changes, sorry, uh, impacts uh, of all kinds that are being predicted, you know, from sea level rise to impacts on ecosystems, agriculture and forests and so forth. But water is the first thing, the first change that we see. Um, one of the big changes that we see will, is with snowpack, and this is the year to talk about this, right? I mean, we have none. <laughs> but there actually was just a little layer of snow on Snoqualmie Pass as we drove over today that wasn't there a few weeks ago. But um, this uh, graph, which was put together by the uh, Climate Impacts Group at UW, shows the decrease in snowpack in uh, both the Cascades and Northern Rockies region not looking forward, this is looking backward. This is actually looking at changes that have already occurred over the last few decades. So observations between 1950 and 1997. This in turn is affecting the amount of water that's flowing in our rivers, particularly during summer months because that snowpack is like a natural storage system that infiltrates into the ground or runs off and feeds into our rivers. And that's why our rivers flow in the summertime when it's not raining. It's because of the melting snow. A tree ring study looked at, was able to look at sort of precipitation over, you know, a several hundred year period and concluded that, um, out of the study concluded that April 1 snowpack may decline by 40, uh, on the order of 40% by the 2040s relative to the last century. <clears throat> and then of course we have the disappearance of the glaciers. And the, dis and the loss of glacier, uh, glacial mass, as it's called, is important for the Columbia River because the Columbia River is fed in British Columbia by the Columbia ice field and the Columbia ice field is melting. In fact, Canadian climatologists are telling us that some of the major glaciers are going to be gone within 20 to 30, 20 to 50 years. So there are going to be very big changes in the way that the Columbia River is flowing. And we saw, um, I think uh, Paul had, maybe Scott too, had, you know, the hydrographs. The uh, blue line here represents sort of the historic natural flow. And instead, what we're going to see is a big amount of water coming in, more in the spring. You can see here we start with October as the beginning of the water year, but less in the peak and even less in the summer months. There's already a lot of demand on water in the summer months for the Columbia River, and so this is, this is going to make things very difficult. Uh, the National Climate Assessment, which is a very important climate change document that came out about a year ago, had four messages for the Northwest, and one of them was that changes in the timing of stream flow relating to snowmelt 
are already observed, as we've just seen, will reduce the supply of water for competing demands and cause far-reaching ecological and socioeconomic consequences. So then we took step back and think for a minute about, we, so we know big changes are coming from a hydrologic perspective with the Columbia River. And we also know, as Scott emphasized, that the treaty itself is going to change in 2024. Flood risk management is gonna change, and that means the way we run our reservoirs in the United States is going to have to change. We're gonna to have to draw them down more in the springtime and be ready for that bigger spring flood. And we're gonna have a lot less flexibility in the summertime. So in looking at modernizing the Columbia River Treaty, I wanna first give a shout out to the Columbia Basin tribes and the First Nations because truly it has been their leadership that has led us into a conversation about changing things in a way that maybe will save <laughs> future generations. I mean, we're really, we're talking about potential crisis here with how, uh, with the change in the hydrology and how water is managed. But we also have a recommendation from the US and a so-called decision from British Columbia is what they called it, but their recommendations on management. And they have many components to these recommendations, but I wanna focus on what they say about climate change. And what they say is we've got to adapt. Climate change is coming and we've got to build a new treaty so that the treaty is capable of adapting to changes that we, well actually we're, we're, we have some predictions now about what's going to happen, but our ability to handle that in the future. So both the U.S. says we've got to have a strategy for adapting the treaty to future changes, and B.C. said the same thing. Adapt adaptation to climate change is, must be incorporated into treaty planning and implementation. Um, so what does adaptation mean? This is, so this is, is kind of an abstract term, right? What do we mean by adaptation? So that we can look at it from a process standpoint with a little flow chart here. It says, identify current problems and changes in the system, assess the vulnerabilities, develop a strategy, identify, implement, and then go back and monitor and reevaluate, and if it didn't work, do something different, right? Okay, well that's all very well putting in the abstract, but that's, we've got to start thinking a little bit more specifically about what needs to be done at this point in time. And so we have what I call the four adaptations, which turn out to be, and I didn't know this, almost exactly the same thing that Paul just told you. Uh, I didn't know Paul was gonna talk about flood risk management, but we need to have a more holistic way of looking at floods. The water in the reservoir might be doing us more good if it's actually in the floodplain the estuary, feeding the estuary, feeding the river. We need to think about food production values. This is my special message tonight. This is a little different. We've got to look at fish passage, changing river management and opening up those blocked areas. And we need to begin to look at ethical governance and decision making. So let's walk through these four things quickly. First of all, flood management. You've heard a lot about this but I really wanna um, recommend to you reading uh, the work of Bar uh, Barb Cousins, who's a professor at the University of Idaho, a very deep thinker on this, who said, resilience is what we need. Resilience in the ecosystem and changing how we store water, storing water more naturally in the floodplains is a way to achieve that. Second, I wanna talk about producing food in the Columbia Basin. I live in the Columbia Basin. I drive across the Columbia uh, Irrigation Project every time I come to Seattle, and it's not a very sustainable method of agriculture that's going on out there. But we won't go that far. We'll just talk a little bit about what's being grown out there. Are we really using our water, and a lot of water is being taken out of the Columbia River in the best possible way? For example, we're exporting a lot of alfalfa outside of the United States. It's being flooded uh, being grown through flood irrigation in the Kittitas Valley for Japanese racehorses. Maybe not the best use of our water. We grow a lot of potatoes in the Columbia Basin, in Washington, in Idaho, and also in Oregon. And with these potatoes, which are, can be a nu nutritious crop, we are making french fries and potato chips and tater tots. In fact, we are the largest producer of french fries and we are exporting french fries throughout the entire planet. 
Is this the best use of water that can be made in the Columbia Basin? We're growing a lot of corn for fuel. In fact, what this graph shows us, this middle blue line here, is kind of a confusing graph, but it connects over here to the percentage increase in the amount of corn grown for fuel rather than food over <clears throat> the last, from the starts in 1966 through 2010. You can see there's been a substantial increase. Is this the best use of our water? So I, think, I believe that we need to come back and we need to begin to reevaluate re and not simply leave it to um, what it, it, the market system, uh, we need to, uh, there's certainly lots of subsidies in our agricultural system we might want to be thinking about. If, the, if we're going to take water out of the river, we should be thinking about getting the most nutrition per gallon of water. Of course, a lot of the nutrition related to that water is comes from salmon. Salmon is one of the most nutritious foods you can have. And agricultural water diversions are conflicting with salmon. There, less water in the river means warmer temperatures. And so there is a conflict going on between the amount that's being taken out and the amount that's left in and what's available to the salmon. So it's something to think about. What is the best use of each drop of water? Because in, in the coming climate impaired world, uh, global food production is going to be a huge issue. I mean, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I think that famine is going to be an issue. So what we grow is, it's not a joke, it's a very important thing. Uh, <clears throat> lack of available habitat, as it turned out, as it turns out, is also um, turning out to be a limiting factor on salmon recovery in the Columbia Basin. You've already seen this map which shows uh, the blocked areas in the red here, uh, including uh, in southern Idaho, Oregon, and into the upper Columbia River. These areas need to be opened up, and so this is the, the third uh, of the uh, adaptation uh, ideas, and that is to reintroduce fish passage. And Paul has done a good job of running through the amazing change in thinking that's occurred even in the last year over this. Salmon over Grand Coulee Dam? You bet. It actually can be done. And I'm thrilled about it because I live in Spokane and I want the salmon to come back to Spokane. We had the big June hogs came all the way up to the Spokane Falls. So. Uh, <clears throat> And then finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about ethical decision making and a project that's uh, been undertaken by uh, KELP and Sierra Club, and that is thinking about <clears throat> thinking about the Columbia River Treaty and how the future from the standpoint of environmental justice and ethics, and uh, the need to, you know, not just get the best deal, but to think about what is sustainable, what is going to work for future generations, and of course, most importantly, what is just. Uh, to that end, uh, there's a, the Ethics and Treaty Project is holding conferences, meeting with people, and has published a declaration on ethics and modernizing the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, I commend it to you. It's a, a document that you are welcome to sign tonight. Um, there are copies of it at the table over to the right here. So, um, and includes a number of principles, including respecting indigenous rights, protecting and restoring healthy ecosystems, and providing fish passage. Uh, the purpose of the declaration, uh, copies of the declaration have been signed by hundreds, if not thousands of people, and many, many different entities at this point, uh, endorsed by um, most of the major uh, churches uh, within the region, and um, are, um, uh, is a message basically that's being sent to Washington, D.C. in the Department of State. This is how we want you to think about it when you are negotiating this treaty with Canada. So with that, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. So usually, so I don't know if this is on, usually I go, I go after like the Idaho Donkey Breeding Association or some... <laughs> So, uh, so I'm always the last speaker, and I get like 30 seconds. Um, so tonight, I want to make sure to give um, our speakers, our other speakers, a little bit of time. So I whisked through mine very quickly. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to point out and make sure you guys are aware of in the basin. Um, 
One of the things that we absolutely love having is the Columbia Basin Fish Accords with our partners, the tribes. I'm not sure people are familiar with that. That was a 2008 agreement between tribal governments, the U.S. government, to do 10 years of uh, basically investments in the basement, a $900 million investment over 10 years, so nearly a billion dollars, for habitat enhancement, mitigation efforts, other projects that are being taken out or ta uh, taken under or I should say um, coordinated with tribes. So we've got a lot of tribal labor. Do you know how many different tribal folks are working on the accords? Do you have a sense of how many people in the field? So we have actual tribal families, tribal uh, organizations, tribal companies actually doing uh, contract work under the accords in the basin in addition to the other um, investments being made in mitigation and funding. And, and to that end, um, for 2012, to give you an example of mitigation funding and wildlife funding and enhancement uh, efforts in the basin, $450 million of direct expense from BPA to fund those activities. That's uh, in, and, in and above what we did for hydropower de-optimization, essentially, so running the hydro system to help the fish as opposed to selling that um, or using that uh, electricity you could have produced. And so I just want to make sure that to, to the folks have that basis of understanding as well, because as a, a group that uh, is heavily involved in public policy and voting and being informed, it's an important part, I think, of what the basin has decided is a right thing to do in terms of mitigating some of these past impacts. And I think when you talk about past impacts and you talk about building dams and authorizing dams, those were congressionally authorized through the United States, through support of citizenry, through a lot of debate and discussion and thoughts about what was right for the time. And that's why I think we're around the table today, to say what are, what are the right things for the times right now and how can we make adjustments? And I think all, we have all collectively agreed in the regional recommendation that it makes sense to, to look at some additional ecosystem enhancements above what we're doing now. And one of the questions, let me just segue into, uh, and, and the other thing I wanted to point out with Rachel, um, we totally agree about the climate is changing. We agree that there is a lot to be concerned about for the future. And I think when you talked about adaptation, I think what one thing that's important is exactly how the wording is there. It's, it's to, I think it would, I wish that was still on the screen, but essentially in the recommendation, what we're trying to do is be uh, adaptable to future change. Because you're right, you can get into a world of just sort of studying it to death versus taking action. And I think what we're trying to say is let's take some action, let's be flexible in the future uh, and use these reservoirs in a way that we can to try to, to help ourselves um, uh, in, the, in the face of climate change. One last thing, just really quickly, is around, this, around the country right now, utilities that are faced with the issue of having to build more power production, you certainly heard a lot of talk about solar power. Solar power is a great resource when the sun is shining. Um, and I think more is going to be developed there. More is going to be developed in the storage environment, which is really exciting. But hydropower for the Northwest, it is a renewable, clean resource, zero carbon output from the hydro facilities. That's an important consideration. Utilities around the country who are building large base scale uh, power plants, those power plants that need to be running all the time to keep the lights on like they are tonight, the sun's not shining right now. Um, those, uh, those folks are talking about natural gas. Uh, coal is being retired, natural gas is replacing it. We have, luckily, mostly hydro or a lot of hydro in this region. So, um, don't want to take all that time, but I wanted to at least just uh, touch on a couple of things. Why didn't they build uh, fish passage into the dams in the first place? Are there new technologies for the big dams? So I, I think that you will see that there have been amazing improvements to the dams uh, in the Columbia River Basin over the time. Over time, um, we're currently at a 96 and 93 percent survival rate for fish passage uh, through the dams. So we are having a tremendous success record. 2.3 million fish returned in 2014. That is a record since 1937 when Bonneville Dam was was built. So. Have we come a long way in fish passage? Absolutely. Were we in the right place when we first started out? Probably not. And that's why we've built this um, successive system of um, how to better handle sending juveniles safely downstream and getting adults back upstream for spawning. Uh, and also augmenting with other facilities like hatcheries. Did we know as much in 1937 as we do now about fish? Absolutely not. Did we make change? Absolutely. 
Oh, do you want I to think, answer the other question, which was about high head dams? Um, well, I can I can talk about that. I think okay, that I can answer that one too. Yeah, I think the question was getting at really towards like Grand Coulee and some of like Hell's sure. Canyon and okay. and uh, those dams were built without um, passage, but that was back in the a long time ago, and uh, maybe you could shed some light on why that didn't occur. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think even today, um, folks who have what we call you know, high head dams, essentially dams that are very tall, um, they are still technically challenged with how to create passage over high head dams. When Grand Coulee was built, it was not designed with a um, fish passage facility for sending juveniles downstream or for um, bringing the adults back up. Uh, we have augmented in that region with hatchery production. Um, we do acknowledge that there, the passage does stop at Grand Coulee. I also think that since we're under the umbrella tonight of talking about the Columbia River Treaty, it's important to say what's a treaty issue and what's a regional basin issue. Fish passage over Grand Coulee may be a larger discussion than a Canadian uh, Columbia River Treaty discussion because the other thing is, just like when you show up to a dance, it takes two to dance, and we're showing up at the dance saying we want to talk about fish passage, or at least there are stakeholders in the United States who want to talk about it. We still don't have a clear signal from Canada about once we put a fish up into a large body of water up above Grand Coulee Dam, then what? So I think we need to talk a little bit more about how we work through the passage issues, including studying it, which as we've said, let's study it. And I think that's a really important part here is let's have some feasibility studies. Let's look at some um, possible pathways that could be explored. Um, and that's a first step, right? Uh, obviously you wanna do your research, research before you uh, create a strategy. Sure, uh, and then I want to say something. Um, just, well, sorry. Um, I, I do want to say, I think it uh, takes two to dance is true, but in Canada, the, the, there are fish blocking dams on the Columbia in the Canada, uh, British Columbia portion of the basin, um, but they are prepared for passage. Um, they've thought it through in terms of their engineering and their conditions on the licenses that are held by the dams. And so if the fish show up at the border, I think Canada will take care of. I, I do, I, I will say, I think Canada doesn't want to pay for fish passage in the United States. They don't want to have to be, or have that be part of the calculus for the treaty, so. But um, Canada, once the fish arrive, and we're already seeing this in basins where fish is being restored, they cannot be denied, so. And uh, Paul, you want to add to that? There, there is a pretty clear signal from the Canadian government that they don't want fish passage to be a part of the Columbia River Treaty renegotiation. But one thing is clear is that the people up there want the fish, and the government's not going to tell you uh, the same thing. But they do want the fish too. So we have one thing that they want from us, and that's the fish. They don't, like Rachel said, they don't want it to be a part of the negotiations because then it could come into play with, say, a uh, recalculation of the Canadian entitlement. It becomes a benefit that they have to calculate and would be a very good reason for the United States to pay less money in the future. So that's why they don't want to be part of the discussion. That's the only thing they want from us is the fish passage. And so uh, once we get into a full negotiation process, all that's going to come to play. But right now, each country is just, just posturing. But the, the people in the Columbia Basin, the citizens of the Columbia Basin want the fish back. That's clear. I have a question I want to read. So, for so can I, let me, let me just, can I just finish one last bit on that? And I think, I just want to circle back to one, one other uh, point here is that there is obviously a lot of interest in the passage issue. There's a lot of stakeholder um, interest as we're seeing right here with, with both the tribal and the climate side. And there are other stakeholders who are interested as well. And we know that that's going to be a topic of discussion and we welcome that. So I think that's an important part, right? Let's have a discussion about what's the science, what's the cost, what's the benefit both to, to both countries? Um, what are the benefit to uh, tribal nations? What are the benefits that we, we see from that? And what are, again, some of the risks and the costs? And let's have an honest and open discussion about that. So I think that's what you'll see uh, coming forth. Okay, so Denise identified this as what she thought was an important question, so I'm going to ask it to the two of you. 
Uh, what sort of major crisis do you anticipate might affect the Columbia River Basin in the next 20 years, and what preparations can be made? I think um, a lot less water is going to be a big problem for everybody. And we're going to have a, a lot more people moving up to the, um, the Pacific Northwest because they will have even less water than us. And so there's going to be a huge demand on the water and the land for producing things that are not natural. So I think we, that's probably going to be our biggest crisis. It'll be driven in large part by climate change. Will we see climate change effects in the Columbia Basin? Certainly, but there's other parts of the country that are seeing it more dramatically and they're going to be looking to the Northwest as a place, um, as a sanctuary. So there are a lot of areas where we agree or where we see things differently and I would just say, ditto. <laughs> you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. Um, is there any talk about taking out any dams? Absolutely, there's always talk about taking out dams. Some dams make sense to take out, some dams don't make sense to take out. Um, I think we've seen tremendous amounts of uh, efforts around the country to look at some of the dams where there is a little value from a flood control aspect, from a hydropower aspect, from an agricultural aspect. They're vestiges of the past that made sense at one point and they don't anymore. And you've seen those uh, removed with success. Um, Near us in the Columbia River Basin uh, on the um, White Salmon River was a dam that was run by Pacific Corps, which is a uh, utility that's uh, spread across the West. They removed that dam and returned that river to its natural course. It made sense. Um, the Elwha River, which is near here, uh, uh, just off of the peninsula a little bit, uh, also was a river that was dammed. The Elwha Dam was removed. That made sense. Uh, when we talk about massive removals of large facilities. Uh, there have been cases where that has made sense in the past, and there are cases where it's been studied and decided that it was, did not make sense. So I think you have to always look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there are power plants in California right now that use once-through cooling, which is essentially drawing ocean water in, cooling the plant, and returning the water <laughs> to the ocean. Those are still running right now, but they're scheduled for retirement. They made sense at one time. They don't make sense now, according to the folks in California who said, let's shut them down. And so those conversations are always happening. Well, I think that was well said. Every dam out there has a different purpose, a different life cycle. Some are losing their value, and some are still of high value, depending on your perspective. Uh, if I could turn the clock back, I, I would rather not have any dams, but, but the fact is, is they're here, and they will be here my entire lifetime, and so I'm devoting all of my professional energy and a lot of my creative energy uh, to, to, dealing with, to, do, to, to dealing with the situation that, that we have at hand, which is to try and get these fish runs restored with these dams in place. Now, eventually, these dams will disappear, and they'll turn to dust. We, we know that, but it's gonna be a long time from now. But until then, we gotta make the best situation of, of what we have. Um, we have a couple questions here about um, the agricultural side of things. That I'll, I'll pose the two questions. I know Steve, or Scott, excuse me, uh, you should start the first one. And that is, how much are Columbia Basin farmers involved in the treaty process? And then the second question is, uh, where can decisions be made regarding food production? So on the food production front, I would say that um, certainly there are divisions of the government which we're not uh, part of. So the Bonneville Power Administration is part of the Department of Energy. We actually don't deal with the food production issue. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation is actually one of the involved parties in the discussion with um, uh, the Columbia River Treaty's future. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation has as one of its statutory purposes the uh, irrigation withdrawals. I think that was mentioned earlier by one of the other speakers. You, so uh, Bureau of Reclamation is a great place to, to start if you wanted to reach out to folks there. Um, I believe the USDA is also uh, engaged as well, U.S. Department of Agriculture. So those would be appropriate um, spots to, to talk about. Uh, the food equity issues. And I think one of the issues was also agricultural and farmers. How many are showing up? Yeah, how many are involved in the treaty process? You know, we've had a, a good turnout around the basin from stakeholders on different 
fronts, so I wouldn't be able to give you an, an estimation of the number of farmers. There have been some agricultural interests, but I think in terms of the sum total for barging, for environment, for tribal, everything, that no matter what you get, you'd still like more. I mean, the thing is, is that the more you have, uh, sort of like crowdsourcing, the more you have, the, the better you have to work with in terms of people's ideas and input. So uh, encourage people who have uh, different viewpoints on the treaty or the same viewpoints on the treaty to reach out and, uh, and voice them. Okay, then I'm gonna ask a question. Okay, all right. Um, I would add that uh, in some ways the states, particularly uh, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, have stood in, in their, with their representatives as proxies for the agricultural sector uh, and in fact I've heard that there, uh, the Washington and Oregon said that they wanted as part of the treaty process to be guaranteed an additional two million acre feet of water to be diverted out of the Columbia River in the future for agricultural production. So there is representation that has occurred. Yes, so. thanks for pointing that out. I was thinking of my federal hat, so thank you for clarifying. And I would say as far as decisions about agricultural production, I mean, it goes against our way of thinking to say, oh, the farmer can't decide what he or she wants to grow. But in reality, many of these, um, many agricultural lands are served by federal irrigation projects. Uh, that are heavily subsidized uh, by taxpayers through uh, the energy that moves water around and uh, other subsidies and so forth. And then, of course, we have them, uh, the Farm Bill. So there are mechanisms by which we could um, uh, impose some restrictions on what the crops are that are being grown. I have a question here directed towards Rachel, but you're welcome to contribute too, Scott. Uh, why is uh, Canada opposed to including ecological considerations in the new treaty? But it was said, it's, it got your name on the top. <laughs> I didn't write it. Well, I, I don't know that I would say necessarily that I agree with the question as it's phrased, which is that Canada is opposed to ecological considerations. I, I, there is a movement in Canada and uh, there's an interest and uh, recognition that uh, there needs to be a change in reservoir operations in the Canadian uh, that are backed up behind the Canadian dams in order to um, uh, improve habitat for fisheries there as well as um, as Paul said citizens in the basin want to see the return of salmon so um, but I, I guess I can't speak entirely to whether they, I, I don't think that they've excluded it from the treaty process is where I think you might be able to help out a little bit. Sure. Yeah, and, uh, and Paul, please feel free to, uh, to chime in as well. I, I think when you look at the eco, uh, ecological considerations on either side of the border, you have different uh, areas of, of concern or interest. For instance, Paul showed the slides where you saw some reservoir dry, uh, drawdowns and essentially those dry up and then you have dust, um, those kinds of issues, environmental issues because of the fluctuating water uh, levels in those reservoirs. Um, so that is certainly an issue for a lot of folks from an ecological perspective uh, in Canada. And then we have, on the ecological perspective, of course, a lot more issues that are around actual you know, fisheries and uh, fish habitat and that kind of thing. So I'd say they're just different perspectives. There might be some, some crossover on the fish front, but probably more uh, intensely focused in the United States because of our, the fact that we have you know, fish runs uh, uh, in this side. I, I always find these kinds of questions uh, interesting. You know, like, what does, what does Canada want? or what don't they want? And um, they are having the same kinds of conversations about what does the United States want. And, and uh, they look at a panel like this and they lump us all together. And we are as diverse as you get, the three of us. So we're doing the same thing with Canada. What does Canada want? But uh, the fact is that there's a government um, role and then there's the citizens uh, of, that, that also support the government and can control the government through their own voting and the use of their taxpayer dollars. So um, you know, we have to be really careful when we overgeneralize, you know, what does Canada want? Because uh, different parts of Canada want different things, just like in the United States. I can ask another question if you guys want. This is for both of you, but I suppose we could all chime in. Um, what is the most important thing for us to get across to our members and the public? Do I can, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. So I'm going to remind you of your text from the 1959 
uh, voter piece because I like it, and it just says all the people of the Northwest having an adequate voice in policymaking, and I just can't say that enough because uh, you know if we could get more young people involved today in making decisions, I, I think there's a concern about um, uh, activism and turnout and and people being involved in in sort of heady. Uh, policy issues that are complex and have lots of different moving parts to them. Um, people are busy. They've got their, their own lives that they're working on and, and things that they're doing in their own careers. But these kinds of things, these issues are important to all of us in the Northwest. And so I would say that's, uh, that's one of the most important things for you guys to get across to your members is if you have a same point of view, great, voice it. If you have a different point of view, great, voice it. You know, it's very important for us. That's the way we work as a democracy. I'll just I'll just add to that just to a reminder that uh, there is a declaration on uh, ethical governance here uh, that copies of it here tonight and we encourage you to sign it to use your voice and to read it understand it and and I also have to say thank you because holding a forum on the Columbia River Treaty in Seattle is not necessarily a place where we would expect to get such a great turnout of people yeah. so I'm uh, very glad that you're here tonight and you are doing a, a good job. Well, you, you saw our PowerPoints and the messaging that, that we had, what we thought was important, but uh, when I look at how the Columbia Basin was has been managed, it's been really a handful of government people who have made all the decisions, and for for a citizenry that, that really didn't know what was going on. And so a group like this coming together with a focus on and how can we wrestle control away from that and have a better future for future generations? And that's what you're doing here. I think it's very important. If you can get more people involved like this, I think you're doing a wonderful service, uh, not just to the Columbia Basin, but to the people of the Northwest, is just get involved and take control of your future.